The development of programming has been going on for a while and can be categorized into generations of programming languages. So now the first generation of programming languages was machine language. Now this is bits, which is ones and zeros, and this is what all code needs to break down into for a computer to understand it. So as you have an idea, it's very unusable or very unreadable, very hard to understand, and it takes an extremely long time to implement. Um, and many, many, uh, many of those developers aren't around anymore and not much machine um, language coding is done by hand. So to make that the task of machine uh, language coding a bit easier, then came along the second generation of programming languages. So these are the low level assembly languages, and these are basically batched sets of instructions of machine language. So it's a bit more understandable. Again, it's pretty low level, but it does make the, uh, the task of coding machine language a lot easier. So it's just a further abstraction of that first level. And then the big step came with the third generation. So these are higher level languages like C, C++, uh, Visual Basic and JavaScript. So it makes the task of coding these functionality out a lot easier. However, non-IT uh, people still look at this and they look at it like gibberish. So then we have the fourth generation. Now this is much more human readable language. Um, and these primarily refer to sort of database uh, programming and scripting, things like Python, SQL, uh, Oracle. And as you can see, it's a much more interpretable way of uh, getting data. And then the latest uh, jump in that evolution is the fifth generation program language. And I'm using inverted commas here because the fifth generation languages are more tools um, and they use graphic and graphic displays to basically abstract programming concepts. So the whole journey of evolution of programming has just been an abstraction upon the previous level. So the goal is just to get more and more people being able to communicate with computers without having a deep understanding uh, of the actual stack. So now, just to demonstrate this concept, I've made this little uh, graph um, of the evolution of each generation. So as you see, as we move from the lower level to higher level, your usability in terms of understanding the language and being able to implement stuff that you know increases. And as the level of abstraction increases, so does your development speed. So in the first generations, it was very hard to even make sort of a calculator, whereas now you can create whole whole APIs and programs within a few clicks. And that's where we're going for in terms of programming. All right, now, so the latest jump has been from the fourth generation, which is your typical programming language that you're probably familiar with, uh, to the fifth generation, which is low code. So now, as you can see here, it reduces thousands of lines of code into basic visual elements. So now they low code platforms allow non scored users to create uh, applications graphically. So developers use pre built components and these components normally achieve a commonly implemented task uh, underlyingly in code and people can just use that task at hand. So time isn't spent on writing out and rewriting out thousands of lines of like reusable code. Rather, you just spend your time configuring the logic um, at specific integration points. And now the, another major advantage of using local code tools, I hope you can see from this diagram, is that um, you're almost able to directly translate your business logic into an application without having an underlying knowledge of the stack. So less requirements are miscommunicated between developer and system analysts to the actual customer. Um, and there's less flaws in terms of business logic because they've been implemented as is. So now another advantage with this is that by following this sort of model, you're able to implement your designs almost immediately. So as you come up with a design, you can put, you can test the feasibility of it in practice, you can run it through a system, and then you get your results. So by using this method, you're able to iterate on your designs, change them up as you build, and you can pretty much design as you build, um, which really saves a lot of time in terms of getting the proper requirements for communicated, getting the approvals, getting another person to actually build the logic and then test it, you can take care of this all by yourself. And another, another great advantage is for non-technical users is that by representing these flows graphically, they're way more in line in, in terms of how people think of their own processes. So people can just focus on the core logic without actually having to um, sort of worry about things like memory management and stuff like that. Um, so I'm just checking, is there a question? 
Okay, no, cool. Um, all right. So now to give you an idea of the low code landscape, um, I just sort of put a few, a few of the names up here. Obviously I'm from Lynx, so I'm a bit biased, um, but there are literally hundreds of different low code platforms out there. Now, each of these varies in its complexity and the type of tasks it does. Um, they could be dealing with the front end or the back end, just purely API. So there is a range of uh, applications and services that you can use to make your life easier. Now, in my experience, I classify low code into three sort of spheres. Now, the most simple are point to point connectors. So these are simple pre made tasks that basically allow you to, to trigger an event once, trigger an action once something happens. So, say I receive an email from X and I want to send an email to Y, something like Zapier or if then then else will help me do that. So the complexity isn't very high. However, these things work really well straight out the box because they only do a specific task. Um, then moving on, we've got the workflow sphere. So a workflow or RPA, robotic process automation. Now these are more complex um, in the fact that they can do multiple sort of flows of information. So they can kick off multiple events, they can store states, they can have sort of people coming back and approving stuff. And that really sort of touches in more of your sort of business flow um, of your typical processes. And then the last sphere is application development. So things like links and out systems, they, they are low code application development platforms, but they allow you the same flexibility as you would in typical coding. So while the other sort of RPA and point to point connectors are very, very strict, um, these bigger systems are capable of much more complex um, applications, much like you would in typical coding. So now all these, uh, all these software and, and services, they all have their strengths and weaknesses. And depending on what task you want to achieve or the system you are integrating with, they all have their um, advantages and disadvantages. And that's something you must keep in mind when implementing these.